Oh, Argentina, home of Lionel Messi, known for its friendly people and stunning landscapes, where you dance tango with passion by night and gorge under the warm sun by day and... Wait a minute, is that... is that Hitler? Oh my god, that's Hitler! What is he doing in Argentina? It is April 30th, 1945, and the Allies are collapsing on Berlin. In his bunker, Hitler realized that all hope was lost and decided to end it all. Or did he? How do we actually know that he did? After all, no one saw his body, and even Stalin claimed that he had escaped, possibly to Spain or Argentina. And in the following years, the FBI compiled many reports that spotted Hitler in Argentina, even acquiring a handwritten letter signed by the German Führer. On top of all that, the school that Soviets had said belonged to Hitler was analyzed by scientists in 2009 and determined to have belonged to a woman, not Hitler. All I have mentioned is true. So what happened? Could Hitler have escaped? Let us look at the evidence a little closer. When the Soviets took over Berlin, they were more concerned with securing their city and celebrating their victory than carefully preserving the bunker as a crime scene. An unknown number of people, from soldiers to politicians to journalists, had access to the bunker and smuggled articles out as souvenirs. So much was scavenged that by the time Western investigators arrived, the bunker had been looted to the extent that even the fabrics from the furniture had been torn off and stolen making a thorough crime scene analysis impossible. While it is true that the skull was not actually Hitler's, that says more about Soviet crime scene negligence than anything else. It is likely that the Soviet coroners made a mistake that they were too afraid to report to Stalin. Hey Ivan? Yes? I think we made a mistake. What? What do you mean? You know the skull we said was Hitler's? Mm -hmm. I don't think it's actually Hitler. Are you sure? A hundred percent. Should we tell Stalin? Uh, yeah, I know he can be tough, but I'm sure he will value our honesty and integrity. Hello, my dear loyal scientists. Did you analyze Hitler's skull yet? Are you certain it's him? Well, actually, we want to talk to you about that. Thank you, kind comrade. <sighs> Wait a minute. Is this Mocaccino? I asked for a cappuccino! To the gulag! So, you want to tell me something about Hitler's skull? That's Hitler, yep, totally, that's him, yep, that's, that's Hitler. However, the skull was not the only bone fragment found by the Soviets. What conspiracy theorists tend to forget is that they found a much more damning piece of evidence. A bone fragment from Hitler's jaw, which they took to his official dentist, who positively ID'd it. In later years, it was further confirmed by comparing it with an X-ray image of Hitler's jaw taken in 1944. Well, what about Stalin's claims? If the Soviet knew that Hitler was dead, why did Stalin claim that he had escaped? It turns out that this was a political strategy. By claiming that Hitler was alive, Stalin could strengthen his claims to territory in Germany by claiming that it would be safer for the Soviets to remain in the disputed areas. It also undermined his political opponents, such as Shukov, who had claimed that Hitler was dead. Well, but Hitler was spotted in Argentina, right? That is true, many claim to have spotted Hitler in Argentina, and it is a famous destination due to the fact that lower-ranking Nazi officers did escape there, but that was not the only place Hitler was spotted. People reported seeing Hitler in Denmark, in several cities across Germany, in New York, in LA, in New Orleans, in St. Louis, in Washington DC, as well as many other American cities, and also in Colombia, Brazil, Uruguay, Ireland, in a Spanish monastery, in a Tibetan monastery, and even in Egypt after having allegedly converted to Islam. Let's see the case of an FBI investigation that interviewed a woman who claimed to have spotted Hitler on a train. Hello, FBI? Yes, ma'am, how can we help you? I think I just saw him. Him? Him! Him who? He who shall not be named. Voldemort? Did you just see Voldemort? This is very serious, ma'am. It's the third time- No, 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 no. Hitler. I saw Hitler. Hitler? Yes. 
This Hitler? Yes. Well, he didn't look exactly like that, but I know it was him. Well, how do you know that, ma'am? Because he was speaking German. And keep in mind that recognizing Hitler's face in a time without internet is hard. I have been showing you an image of Hitler for a while now, but that is not actually Hitler. That is a lookalike. This is the real Hitler. Except that this is not Hitler either. That is a lookalike too. This is the real, real Hitler. Or is it? I hope this illustrates just how unreliable testimonies can be, even when well intended. But in reality, claims were often questionable, at the very least. Journalists and writers loved writing about Hitler's escape because it sparked the public's interest and sold publications. Politicians in Argentina used the opportunity to smear the sitting President Perón by linking him to Nazis. And sometimes the claims were simply the product of individuals with troubled minds, as was the case of the supposed Hitler letter, which was determined by FBI investigators to be a forgery by an 80-year-old man with dementia. Although conspiracy theories were plentiful, the reality was that every claim that the American, British or Israeli intelligence agents investigated ended up being fake. Now you might be wondering, well, if they knew he was dead, why did the agencies investigate Hitler's death at all? Well, there were several reasons. Often, claims about Hitler's whereabouts actually led to Nazi officers that did escape that people just confused with Hitler. The FBI was also struggling to maintain international relevance. The CIA had just been created and was overtaking many of the roles that the FBI used to have. For that reason, the FBI director saw in the Hitler investigation a way to show the importance of his agency. Okay, so maybe he didn't escape. But how can we know for sure? Let's review the evidence. Starting May 1945, British officials began collecting evidence relating to Hitler's end. In charge of the investigation was a man called Hugh Trevor Roper. Trevor Roper reviewed interrogations conducted by British agents to capture bunker survivors and attempted to reconstruct what truly happened. One of the interrogations was to a man called Hermann Karnau, a guard on duty that was stationed outside the bunker at the time of Hitler's cremation. I was ordered by an SS officer to leave the vicinity of the Reich Chancellor for a time and did so. When I returned to the garden, I saw the bodies of Hitler and Eva on fire two meters from the emergency exit. He was interrogated several times and cross-examined carefully until his interrogators were satisfied that he was speaking the truth. He even drew an image of the location where he claimed Hitler and Eva were buried. Kana was reinterrogated in September and retold the story almost identically. His testimony was supported by the interrogation of another Reich Chancellor guard, Hilko Poppen, who stated that Karnau told him on May 1st, 1945, that Hitler was dead and that he and Eva lay in the garden and burned. He also claimed that Hitler was buried in a bomb crater in the garden, which he drew on a diagram closely matching the one drawn earlier by Karnau. Poppen too was reinterrogated months later and repeated this story consistently. His interrogator, Captain Ingram, considered that he had given the information to the best of his ability and that, as far as he could tell, the statements were true. A third interrogee was called Kemka, Hitler's chauffeur, who claimed that Otto Günsche, Hitler's bodyguard, telephoned him on April 30th and requested that 200 liters, or if you are a freedom-loving American patriot, 53 gallons of petrol be sent to the Führer's bunker. Kempka complied and later made his way over to the Führer bunker, where Günsche told him that Hitler was dead. Kempka then saw Hitler and Eva's bodies being carried out of Hitler's room and even helped carry them into the garden along with Günsche and Linge. They poured petrol over the bodies and burned them before returning inside due to heavy Russian artillery fire. Another guard, Mansfeld, stated that he saw through an observation slit in the tower a huge column of black smoke. Minutes later, when the smoke had partially cleared, he could see two burning bodies about two meters to the left of the emergency exit. He later investigated the corpses and recognized Eva. The other one, however, was burned beyond recognition. He entered the guard's room and heard SS Gruppenführer Rattenhuber request three men to bury the bodies. The next time Mansfeld was ordered to guard the emergency exit, the bodies were nowhere to be seen but he noticed that a shell crater four to five meters in front of the emergency exit door had been partially covered. He suspected that what was left of Hitler and his wife 
lay within. Mansfeld was cross-examined three times until his interrogators were satisfied that he was telling the truth. Each of these witnesses drew maps of the situation and both their accounts as well as drawings remain consistent with one another. Could they all have been lying? In principle, sure, but to have so many people lie so convincingly to expert interrogators and remain consistent in time as well as with each other is very unlikely. But there is one final element to consider, which is a very dark topic. If discussions of self-harm are triggering to you, skip ahead to the timestamp down below. Truth is, Nazism was an incredibly nihilistic ideology. Their war project was not one to be attempted again at a later date. It was victory or death. It was not only Hitler who decided to end his own life. All of Germany was overtaken by a wave of mass suicide as the war came to an end and Nazis wished to escape the humiliation and punishment that would come with defeat. Hitler knew what had happened to Mussolini's body in Italy and wished to avoid the same fate. He was documented to have expressed fear of being paraded in Moscow inside a monkey cage, which would further have inspired him to end his life. Another important factor was his wife, Eva Braun. British intelligence speculated that the suggestion probably came from her. She had always wished for the glory of time with Hitler and had repeatedly used her influence to persuade him to stay and die in Berlin. Those closest to Hitler, such as Josef Goebbels, also chose to commit suicide, inspired and encouraged by the knowledge that their leader had also done so. In fact, Goebbels' wife Magda begged Hitler not to kill himself, for she knew that if he did, she would have to kill her own children, her husband and herself, for she did not want to live in a world without Nazism and her Führer. Soviets discovered the bodies of the Goebbels marriage and their six children dead from cyanide poisoning inside the bunker. It is inconceivable that Goebbels would have done this if she believed that Hitler was still alive. There is one final thing to consider. Hitler was the world's most hated man, and even though lower-ranking Nazi officers were welcomed into the US as part of Operation Paperclip, the same was not true for the man responsible for so much death and destruction. The intelligence agencies would not have allowed a threat as powerful as Hitler to remain in hiding. The Mossad, the Israeli intelligence agency, was especially concerned with hunting down Nazis to make them pay for their crimes against their people, and it is unthinkable that they would have allowed Hitler to escape. After all, if even your grandma heard about Hitler fleeing to Argentina, do you really believe that the Mossad wouldn't have heard the rumor too? There are some crucial aspects about Hitler's death that remain a mystery. Did he use poison or a gun? And unfortunately, it is very likely that we will never know the answer to that. However, one thing is certain. Adolf Hitler died by suicide in his bunker on April 30th, 1945.